Welcome to The Ruddle Show. I'm Lizette, and this is my dad, Cliff Ruddle. How you doing? Pretty good. We're on show 95, so I'm excited about that on our road to 100. We're getting there. Yeah, and, you know, thanks from the audience out there. You're signing up to Ruddle Plus, and we're pretty excited about being together as we go forward. Okay, well, you might be wondering about this graphic behind us. <laughs> And every now and then, we like to venture away from the concept of a traditional dental practice and give you some ideas of how to use your dental skills in creative and unique ways. On the show, we've talked about the sought-after position of a hockey team dentist. Um, We've talked about um, the possibility of getting involved in forensic dentistry for those of you who are interested in solving mysteries. Well, what about supplying dental fangs to all of your patients who have a morbid fascination with vampire culture. So (laughs) I'm only half joking because this is actually really a thing. Maybe not so much in rural areas, but in big cities, (laughs) there are so-called vampires. Um, So what exactly are dental fangs? Well, dental fangs are custom restoratives that uh, go over existing healthy tooth and um, they can come on and off as necessary. So you can have that spontaneous vampire look if you so desire. And um, all the materials are usually composite, resins, uh, porcelain even. and uh, Sometimes I saw even gold. Yeah, th- thank you. There, Some of them, I guess, to give a little different effect, they have gold. Yeah, solid gold. And so they're removable, and that's the good part because you can do this temporary transformation. Okay, well, when we were searching for information on this topic, we got a couple different perspectives. On one website, vampires.com, they noted that it might, your, your Christian dentist might not want to give you, the vampire patient, fangs. So they said, though, that if you, can, if you can't find a dentist, you could easily shorten your front teeth and have your canines filed. In other words, a very invasive procedure. That doesn't sound ideal. (laughs) If you can find a dentist, they said they suggested the tooth cap option that you mentioned. Mm. And we actually did find a Southern California dentist who offered this service on their website. And on the website, they talked about um, the benefits of having things, who are the ideal candidates. And then they went into the whole installation process, which is what? Well, I think we need to really stress the consultation <laughs> because, you know, at the consultation is where you're going to express everything you expect from these vampire teeth. And, of course, the professional is going to tell, you know, I'm assuming the patient, is going to tell uh, them the risk and the pros and cons and different things like that. So you need to really be aware of what's involved. Uh, if they, if it's a go and they let's go. Um, if you have oral scanners, that's probably the simplest because you just scan the tooth and electronically you can go to a lab and they can download the measurements and uh, CAD CAM can start to mill it. So um, I guess the other thing is, though, I was thinking more like when I went through back in the day and I was thinking there's impressions and you go to the lab and pour up a stone dye and you sent it off with instructions to the lab and the lab might have a few questions because they don't make ram vampire teeth routinely <laughs> so they might want to know what the hell's going on but anyway it, yeah you need that consultation and hear all the patient's expectations uh discuss price how many visits et cetera, et cetera. if there's things that you think could go wrong you got to explain that like it can invertly pop off you might swallow it you might do this but those are consultation things all right well what are are there any prerequisites or requirements well what you showed me in that article that was from a dental practice that does this in Southern California is that before any fangs are made, no, 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 no fangs. There's the journey towards oral health. So it starts with a full mouth examination, models, uh, x-rays, the whole thing that you would do if you matriculate a new patient. And then uh, if there's any caries, those all have to be cleaned up and that would be good, right? We're all saying fine. Uh, Crowns might need to be placed if teeth are badly broken down. Um, everything has to be healthy periodontally as well. And, uh, the occlusion has to be somewhat good. And when all that's done and everything's cleaned up and they've declared oral health, that lives and exists inside your mouth. You get to have fangs. 
Well, this is actually one of the big <laughs> reasons we're doing this segment now instead of October, right before Halloween, because it sounds like this is actually quite a process. And sometimes dentist office, offices are booked a couple months in advance. So you might want to get started on this now if you want to have vampire fangs for Halloween. So you mentioned, like, I'm now going to the drawbacks. You mentioned one might pop off and you swallowed it. You swallow it. Is there anything else you should worry about? It would all come to the fitting because if they fit right, I would like to think your patients can close their teeth with the fangs installed. So if they can't, then there's going to be prematurities when you occlude and you don't want to pop this thing off because then you could swallow it or aspirate it. Oh, an aspirated fang is quite bad. <laughs> and uh, But I love the part. Uh, I thought the guy really was superseding fangs and he was a businessman. Because he got all this dentistry to come in through this advertisement. So that great marketer, uh, genius ploy. And then you get them all healthy and you get all your dentistry done. Your production's good. The patient's paying wildly. They think it's terrific because at the end, boom, bang, bam, you get fangs. Yeah, you did mention to me before we started the show, and I thought it was kind of funny that you said that you should try to avoid any romantic endeavors because you could injure the other person. Yeah, I'm thinking you probably be careful you don't bite down and that thing, you know, could hit the lower arch and cause injuries. And then, yeah, be careful with your romantic maneuvers. Okay, well, I guess maybe it's worth it if you really want that look. So if you're looking, if you're a dentist looking to expand your practice, um, maybe you happen to have an interest in vampire and gothic culture, and of course you're not a Christian, then maybe this is a service that you want to provide in your office. So something to think about. Okay, well, we have a great show today. We're going to talk um, ne in our next segment about a different kind of look, Shielder's look. So let's Whoa. get to that. That will be exciting. So when clinicians share radiographs and digital images, you have probably heard it said that certain cases have the look. So in modern endodontics, the look refers to Herb Shielder's five mechanical objectives for predict predictably successful endodontics. Fifty years ago, Shielder defined the five mechanical objectives for shaping canals that would facilitate the filling or the cleaning and filling of root canal systems while simultaneously fulfilling the biological objectives. And this has long been the standard in endodontics and is an important part of Shielder's legacy. And there's that word again, and we'll get back to that a little bit later. Now, in recent years, there's been a group that has emerged that has maintained that the concept of the look is outdated. So we are going to, today, we're going to revisit the five mechanical objectives, assess if they are still relevant, and then discuss why some people might find the concept of the look problematic. So to start, why don't you just get going w with the five mechanical objectives? Okay, uh, I can just do this little maneuver here. And what I'll tell you is that these objectives came from Dental Clinics of North America, 1974, April edition. 
So for me, this was always my Bible. Did you hear 1974? That's the year you got out. All right. So the five mechanical objectives, uh, I want you to look at the graphic on the right, and it's an untreated molar, obviously, but I want you to look on the left, and, you know, we have a funnel-shaped form, we have a continuous tapering preparation, maintain the position of the anatomy, maintain the position of the foramen, and keep the foramen as small as practical. So that I read back to you. But now we'll go through each five of those, and I'll have another word or two. But the point is, we've talked about this several times over several years uh, on, on various occasions. So we've uh, always talked about this because this is what should be the guiding light. Okay, so what I want to say on this one is uh, a funnel is fle can be flexible if it's the right material, and you can have a funnel with different tapers and cross-sectional diameters as you go along that funnel. And if that funnel is flexible, you could bend it right over and superimpose it over the canal you're going to treat, and that would be number one. Generally speaking, number one is a continuous flowing funnel. Now, uh, in compliance with number one is number two. And in compliance with number two, it complies with this funnel, but it goes into it a little bit more deeper where every cross-sectional diameter as you move down the canal is getting smaller and smaller and smallest towards the terminus. Set opposite, it would mean going from apex to crown, you would be getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you move away from the foramen. So these are important concepts, and that's number one and two. If we go to three, what you'll notice is that it is maintain the original anatomy. Now, in our films, we see mesial to distal. That's obvious. But we're not seeing the curves in and out of the buccal lingual dimensions of the film. So that one's really talking about flowing with the canals. Uh, Herbie talked about, uh, I shouldn't be ir irreverent. Uh, it's Herbie to me, but uh, Dr. Schiller to you. Uh, Anyway, he really wanted to talk about uh, canals flow within the roots that hold them. And they, there shouldn't be steps and irregularities. They should just be moving like a nice, smooth, flowing river. Flow. And that's maintain the original anatomy and in multiple planes. And remember, we're talking about three planes. And we're talking about three planes in any given level of the root. And then you have another three planes. The canal comes. So multiple three planes, and in different planes. Okay, what was our four, uh, next one? Four. It was maintain the position of the foramen. One of the most common things I saw in failures was people would relocate the foramen on the external root surface. So the foramen physiologically in its relationship to the bone should not deviate. They should always maintain uh, the orientation. It might get a little bit bigger, but we really don't have to do a lot of work enlarging the foramen if we have all the other four I just talked about. And finally, I guess the last one would just be keep the foramen as small as practical. Now, when I say practical, a lot of times kids come in. They have big canals, big systems, and your first pile that even snug in anything, they might be a 50 or a 60. But Schilder did say that in general, for the vast majority of cases in molars, it could be, he said, the size of a number three file, which the group out there has never heard of. <laughs> but it would be equivalent to today's ISO 25, size 25. So that is the me uh, mechanical objectives. And it's something that I use on every single case I ever treated. Uh, you might not understand this. So I hold up a pulse therapy film before digital. What do you think I'm saying? Oh, gee, nice job, Cliff. The staff hit me on the back. This is fabulous. It's like artwork. Let's close the office down. Uh, let's have some wine. No, what you do is you hold the film up and you do quietly. You go, um, final shape form, maintain the position of the frame, frame of small. You do a checklist. This is the checklist and it's a checklist. So, when we take away the graphic that we saw earlier, now we can take these objectives. And as you look at the objectives, look at the case and ask yourself, does it exhibit this, 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 and this? Check. Good case. Nice. Next case. Um, if you see something that you don't quite like, um, figure it out. Next case. Don't 
don't linger in the past and don't go back and start to be a hero. Just learn and move on. Okay. So I think this is a nice case. It's not uh, a hard one particularly, but it's got the flow and the look. Well, just looking at the mechanical objectives, they really seem to just be common sense and logical. I'm not really sure why anyone would argue with any of these. And even if you were a proponent of minimally invasive endodontics, I don't think that you would have a problem with these objectives. Um, Schilder doesn't give any dimensions. He just says, keep it. Say that again. He does not give any dimensions. He just says, keep the foramen as small as practical, meaning that you just need to make a big enough shape so that you can clean and obturate whatever method you choose to use. Bingo. So I have a couple of questions, though, related to dimensions um, and how the part they play in the in the idea of the look. So first it says continuous taper. Um, but how important is the percentage taper of the preparation? Is that something you need to be thinking about? And what role does deep shape play? Very good. Um, the first thing I would ask a colleague, if, you know, you just asked me, I'm a colleague of yours, so you're a colleague of mine. So I would say this, how do you intend to disinfect? What's your cleaning method? See, back in the day when Schilder lived and most of the career when I lived, uh, shaping occurred over a longer period of time because we didn't have all the technology. So you had your arrogance inside you a lot longer than in the current days. So the first question is, doctor, in the current era, what is your disinfection method? And I would then want to say, okay, great. And then what is your filling method? Because there's a variety of different things being taught now, single cone, uh, different sealers that emerged with no real efficacy behind them. Uh, we all want to be modern and new, so we jump on these things. But I would have to start off with, if you know what you're gonna, your cleaning method is, and if you know what your filling method is, then I would go back and say, if I have a laser now, you know, 2940, you know, that wavelength, uh, if I have gel wave, which I don't subscribe to, but it's considered by some to be at least better than handheld irrigation, I think that's irrefutable, but I'd want to know that because... A lot of the people who have gone to lasers and gentle wave are making 1703s, 2004s. In other words, you heard me say the preps have gotten decidedly more minimally invasive and they're much more skinny. Those can't be cleaned in any other way than maybe a laser or gentle wave at this time. So uh, I have evidence. In fact, I found a tape last night. I was going to ask you if we should ever show it. It's uh Case 816 from Gary Carr's lab that was done in the field on a molar. Guy did a 1703 prep. Gary Carr clipped it, it was extracted, it failed, and patient didn't want to fool around with the retreatment. Gary did a biopsy on it, and in the apical third of a 1703 prep when the colleague uses jelloways, he said there were sheets and in, in beds of tissue left behind. But we've known this from years from other research. So I don't really subscribe to these skinny scapes, but that will be the first thing I want to know is what is your next two steps going to be? Because that would decide a lot. Now, specifically, I can make a disclosure. I have a team, um, Wash 2, and I won't name all the names. West was on the ProTaper team, but then there was the Wave 1 team. But Wave 1 Gold and ProTaper Gold and ProTaper Ultimate automatically without trying to use 10 to 16 instruments. That's what we used in the day, about 11 files and add about four GGs to that. And you had a, an armamentarium of about 15, say, instruments. Um, you don't think about this much anymore, going through all those files and what are they for? Because you're getting those shapes exactly on your instruments. It's working exactly as the Schilderian philosophy. That's why Schilder embraced Pro Taper towards the end because it absolutely saluted him. So back to a Pro Taper Ultimate, an F2, 25 at the tip, at the top, 16 millimeters away, it's one millimeter. Come on, people. That is a very conservative because where you get the deep shape is apical and around curvatures, but we're keeping the body of the canal slimmer because the maximum flute diameter is one millimeter. So I think 
The last thing I'd like to say is if you get the shapes of the wave one gold or pro taper gold or wave one primary, say, uh, you are going to have a deep shape. Let me explain quickly. Deep shape means you have a volume to accept more fluid. Okay, so if you have more fluid, you're probably thinking, gee, if I have more fluid, more fluid to exchange. If I can have a greater volume of fluid that's not just sitting there and it's activated and it can start to exchange, now I have a, a, a capture zone. When you have deep shape, it holds your solutions inside the canal. When you have shapes that are kind of parallel, especially if they're skinny, it's a two-way street. Stuff can go up and evacuate and vent, but stuff has easier chance, uh, as we saw early in wave one, um, we saw that a lot of the accidents, uh, the, the, the bloody canals and things like that, because there was no resistance form uh, to hold your solution. And finally, deep shape is a wonderful capture zone for warm gutta percha. Okay. Well, another question, if I'm looking at it, and this is related to dimensions too, if I am looking at a case that has the look, approximately what fraction of the root width, in your opinion, would the finished canal prep preparation represent? Excellent. I was uh, working with my multi-team yesterday. Uh, it seemed like a really great day because we were looking at the various shapes. And I want to come back and say one thing about a 2508 F2 or a, pr a primary wave one. It has 19% more volume than your favorite instrument that you like to use, 2506. So let's say it again. 6% holds 19 per le less uh, volume of fluid, cc's, ml's than a 8% taper. So changing the taper changes the volume and changing the volume means the potential to encourage better cleaning. So back to your question, when you look at a film, we're always taught to look at, at the body of the canal. In other words, there's the coronal one third, the middle one third, the apical one third. So we divide the root into thirds. I'm not looking at the apical third for what she just asked me. Uh, we're looking at the body of the canal, the upper two thirds. And it seems like both natural teeth, untreated, and well-treated canals often end up at about a third to a quarter. So the, if you look, you know, mesial to distal, the mesial to distal, the mesial to distal dimensions, you have about the canal would occupy about a third or could out occupy a quarter. So somewhere in there, a quarter to a third is going to be absolutely fine. You'll have endodontically strong teeth. You won't have fracture potentials. What my team and I were doing yesterday to get back to that, we were looking at just a lot of virgin teeth untreated on cliff frontals pre-ops. Many orifices, as I've said a thousand times, when you open the teeth, you're the first guy in, first lady in, they're already one millimeter, okay? So you look at a lot of films, you look at the coronal two-thirds of the canal, it's already occupying maybe a third of the mesial additional dish. I think that's fine. I think it's absolutely fine. Uh, retrievement, all bets are off because they can be much bigger based on history. And then the age of the patient and how big is the uh, premature, the immature root canal. Oh, excuse me, root canal system. So you get de a dealt a deck of cards. Uh, people come in and just be aware of these concepts and don't beat yourself up too much if it's looking like, gee, a, a third, a third, a third. That might be ideal. You might want to be a little smaller. Certainly the minimally invasive people are more like uh, a quarter. Okay, well, what about seeing filled lateral anatomy? Because if you're looking at cases that have the look, don't you generally see maybe some filled lateral anatomy, even though the five mechanical objectives are just about the main canal, right? They are and they aren't. <laughs> because Schiller was uh, probably smarter than most of us. Uh, he realized that if you f took his five mechanical objectives to heart and actually developed those kinds of shapes on a go-forward basis, he knew you would get the root canal system clean because that was the whole reason for his chapter is it, it wasn't how to clean canals. The name of the chapter is cleaning root canal systems. So he realized if you develop those, the anatomy would come. It's kind of like in golf or anything you do in a sport. You work at it, you're floundering, you look awkward, but at some point 
uh, you begin to have a breakthrough, you get a little bump on the plateau of practice, and you go to a little higher level, and now you stay in that plateau for a while, and then you can, boom, make another thing. Like you hear this show, for sure, I know you're going to sign up for Ruddle Plus because you're going to say, I want that next bump on the continuum. So anyway, um, that that's kind of what I would say about that. I, um, I there, You know, why do some of us see bifidities, trifidities, loops, fins, anastomosing, multiple portals of exit. This is the language that Schiller brought us. This is the language because we discovered it through looking at our work. So my impressions are not a lot of people that are doing skinny shapes are getting a plethora of lateral canals. I've said this before. John West has done this for decades. He's said, if I shape the mother canal, how many portals of exit do I usually get? And Johnny's getting, I think, a little over three. So for every one shape canal where his file goes there, he's getting another one or another one. Three portals of exit with one apical uh, where we put the file in. So I think that when the canals get really skinny, if you don't have a laser, I'll keep beating this to death, you're just not going to get anatomy. I've looked at hundreds, maybe thousands of cases filled with BC sealer, uh, small, minimally invasive preps, you rarely see any evidence of the thrill of the fill on post-treatment films. And we'll get to that a little bit later in our discussion. Um, so just to close out with the mechanical objectives, they seem very logical. And there, since there's no, it, it, they also are just not overly restrictive with dimensions that need to be followed. So it seems that they allow for both minimally prepared shapes and then also for larger, more root appropriate shapes as well. Um, Notice the word she used. It was very, very good. It was so ruddle. I'm championing her root appropriate because a lot of this misinformation comes from, oh, it's too big, too big relative to what? So is it root appropriate should be the way we language that. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Like we, we can say minimally prepared and then root appropriate. There you go. Okay. That's better communication. So if, if it allows for both minimally prepared shapes as well as root appropriate, larger root appropriate prepared shapes, why would the concept of the look cause any controversy? Really? <laughs> um. Actually, to be honest, I have no idea if you use one's mind, critical thinking, curiosity, and imagination. I, I, I have wrestled with this ever since this new wave came in about 10 years ago. And I know who the groups is. You know who the groups are. And they're, they're in every country, and they're a little band, and they're almost fanatical about the look. And they compare the look to overzealous shapes that are not root appropriate. And they look at some people that are in it us that do it. And they blame that as that's what Schilder taught. Schilder never taught that. She said three times it's a dimensionless concept. And she mentioned specifically the Freeman's dimensions. The whole length of a prepped and developed shape is basically subjective. And you can do many different things as long as you stay, she said, the range between Minimally invasive and root appropriate. So I think, I don't know, but I guess uh, I looked at you where just a while ago because do we live in a cancel culture? Have you ever heard of that? We do to a large extent. We have a Nindo. This would be exhibit A. Uh, just canceling the book, canceling the look because it doesn't fit your idea. So that doesn't even, uh, and then you make fun of it and then you try to destruct the idea and destroy people and, you know, that's what you get. But the look is very much alive. Schiller used to say, things that look right are right. Things that don't look right aren't right. Okay, well, maybe some of this controversy is coming from what you just mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, it does seem that seeing filled lateral anatomy is an important part of the look. And I can understand with the warm vertical technique, how you're pushing hydraul hydraulically pushing gutta percha. Um, that you would see the lateral anatomy filled. But I'm just wondering if clinicians that use a single cone and BC sealer can see a lot of filled lateral anatomy because my intuition would tell me no, unless the flow properties of the BC sealer are just so superb that it just effortlessly flows into the lateral anatomy. That can happen, and I won't mention names, but on the AAE discussion forum, 
there's a, a, a handful, this is worldwide, of laser users. And I will say, I will happily admit that their preparations are very, very small by my standards. They would not be possible to be cleaned except for that kind of high-end technology. And they do show lateral anatomy. And you can kind of see that uh, I can I can get a pulse on the group. You know, some people are going, well, that's nice. I never saw that. Well, then they tend to trivialize it. It doesn't matter. Uh, do, does it, do lateral canals matter? And they start going into all these different uh, assertions to trivialize one's work. Uh, I do not. I've seen some general wave lateral anatomy, but it's usually with clinicians that are shaping pretty much shoulder driven. Mm-hmm. Like Cami Ferris, she'll be a guest coming up. She's shoulder trained. She shapes to about a 2508, somewhere in there. She's tried to reduce her body work, but her deep shape is just like we've talked about. She shows anatomy routinely. So we want to teach things that the masses can do. We want to teach things that every clinician can do if they so choose. And it shouldn't be so technically challenging or so costly that they're out of the game. And just to remind everyone, we did already mention several times on our show that general practitioners do about 80% of the endodontics in So why do we care if they do root-appropriate shapes, irrigate like we've been talking about? And you know what? They send us cases. Uh, For years and years... When we, she used to work out at the office. Now we work together here on the set, but she used to see the emails that came in and all of people that took our course, they'd show their first vertical canal, their first lateral canal, their first apical division, you know, by affinity. And they were thrilled. So that means it's transferable. Anybody can do it. It's a choice. Well, I think another argument that um, people who have a problem with the look, an argument that they present is that sometimes cases fail and they have the look, and then other times cases are successful that don't have the look at all. So probably these cases represent more the exception, though, than the rule. Yeah, I mean, we all have, uh, we can feed our egos or our argument with an anecdotal sometimes event. In other words, look, I got a lateral canal and my shape was like a 10, 02. You know, a round of applause, but is that reproducible over and over across decades of practicing on the patients you're supposed to be serving? So, yeah, Shoulder all repeated. He said things that don't look right aren't right. So I think uh, it's it's fine to say, Is do you get the anatomy as routinely? No. Uh, John Wesp, Mosh 2, Castellucci, Clef Ruddle, and I can just keep going, so I don't want to embarrass myself and leave you off the list. We taught a root appropriate shapes. People were routinely filling anatomy. On the AE discussion forum, the people that do routine clean and shaping are not showing anatomy because their shapes are too small. Well, I mean, I know there's that expression, you can't judge a book by its cover, but you probably can tell a lot about a book by its cover. And why not appreciate the beauty of the cover if it's beautiful? So (laughs) I I don't know. I think the mechanical objectives are a big part of Shielder's legacy. And there's that word again. And whether or not Shielder realized it, I think part of the genius of his mechanical objectives are that they appeal to logic and common sense. And the fact that he doesn't give any dimensions kind of... um, gives them more of a a timeless nature because if you would have like def- like stated certain dimensions all of a sudden they would have become a lot more transient and maybe not have held the test of time so i think that is an important part of le- legacy to have a certain a timelessness about your work um i think the most powerful le- legacies are those that you know uh what is the uh, transcend time and they endure so that's... Oh, you mean like E equals MC squared? Right. <laughs> All right. Well, later on in the show, when we close the show, you're going to show some cases related to this idea of the look, right? Yeah. At the wrap up, we're going to take the four examples. Looks bad is bad. Looks bad is good. Looks good is bad. Looks good is good. Okay. Well, can't wait for that. All right. We'll see that soon. Thank you for the information. Yeah.
Okay, so at the end of last year, you gave a lecture at USC um, for the John Ingle Symposium. That That's an annual meeting. And your lecture was on 3D disinfection. And we actually have that lecture available to watch on the Ruddle Show website as a special report. So you might want to see the lecture if you haven't um, already. Now, at the end of your lecture, which you submitted a lecture, at the end of your lecture, you did a live Q&A with um, the inter- it was an international audience, I believe. Right. And the- so Elon Rothstein, that's his name, right? He asked you questions and you answered. Professor Elon Rothstein, greetings. I know you're watching, so thank you for that opportunity. So we're actually going to redo this Q&A with the questions that were asked him. Um, and we'll, you can go, well, I guess you can't, you won't have access to the live Q&A that he did, but hopefully his answers will be similar to what they were originally. <laughs> All right. So are you ready for the questions? Well, to say that my answers, there's a 36 minute Q&A and my Q&A is going to be, you tell me, 10 minutes. So we're going to do, sum- we'll do a summary. Of that. Okay. So, but we're going to still ask all the questions. All right. So the first question is this. What is the ideal size of endo activator tip to use in molars? What tip do you recommend? Okay. Well, we talked about this even earlier in in, in the show today, but we talked about uh, Schiller always advocated about a 2508 uh, or O. There you go. 10, if that helps. So, you know, pro taper gold, pro taper ultimate have 2508 and wave one gold. Uh, it's primary, the primary one specifically is a 2507. So, we have seen in the literature since these files were launched decades ago, we have seen much of the literature showing uh, disinfection in these kinds of shapes. So these are the kinds of shapes that have been advocated for decades that when developed and carefully executed, uh, will let you choose your tip. And I typically, if you're shaping somewhere in this range, you would be using the endo activator specifically the smart light pro endo activator and it would be the red tip and the red tip is uh plus or minus a 25 um about an 04 now i say uh plus or minus this these aren't machined they're polymers so they don't cut they're intentionally non-cutting so the ejection molding uh plus or minus a 23 or 27 is in the range of tolerance the point is Choose the tip that fits within two millimeters, just write it down, two millimeters of working length, and that's one. And the second one is loose. So if the tip is tight, you need to either develop a little more shape, not more than this, but you might be using like an 04 or an 06, so you might develop a little more shape if you were so inclined, Or you could go to a smaller tip, and we also have, this is red, we also have a yellow tip. Yeah, would you still get a good result if you put a yellow into Mm -hmm. um, this size canal because you would just get more agitation maybe? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so. Pill bigger than a red? Well, we have a blue one because sometimes kids come in in the office. Remember that case I was just showing you where it was a third, third, third Mm -hmm. on a virgin tooth? Uh, well, that's a big one, see, but there's a lot of them that come in that are really skinny, like older people like me, and they're calcified, more mineralized. So you might not want to just open it up to fit the tip, but you could go to a smaller tip where you'd have that two alpha. Remember, we don't want the tip to be frozen. The whole principle is it must slap those walls and fracture liquids, and to do that, it must move. Okay. Next question. How do you establish working length? What is your method? Oh, this is really easy. Uh, it used to be the radiograph was our go-to, right? Just take an image, take a working film, working film. But uh, then Apex, electronic Apex locators came on the market. They became very reliable even back in the day when I was younger. And uh, so now it's the, well, I guess we can go one more. It's either an electronic Apex locator. And my second opinion would be, 
uh, radiographic image. That's enough. And one thing I talked about, so this is your first go-to right here. Then you're, if you want to sometimes get collaborative information, do both. And then a third idea that I can put down here would just be a uh, paper point drawing method. And I'll explain that. If you put a paper point a little bit through the framing, the part of the paper point that's long is usually red. That part of the paper point that is clean, white, and dry is the measurement from here up to your, your reference point. So you might have this thing coming up like this, and this would be your measuring point. If you had a rubber stop, you'd put it on that. You'd be measuring it from here up around to there. So this is unfortunately only possible once you're done. So it's, this isn't going to help you find working length on your tin file because it won't fit in there. But when you're all done, where do you pack to? That's the most common ruddle. Where, where do you pack to? Is it a half millimeter short? Is it flush? Is it, oh, it's depending on the paper point because this outperforms these two at this level. If it's red, it's beyond. So you just measure the dry part, cut your cone back, and there you go. Okay. <clears throat> the next question. With the advancement in biomaterials, many people are injecting sealers, leading to overfills. How do you apply your sealer, and do you subscribe to injecting these bioceramics into the root canal? Well, this question, you know, that came in from somewhere. I don't know what country or what colleague, but I had much more to say about this on the actual live Q&A. Well, I remember when I was watching it, your reaction when after this question was asked was, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you said that. <laughs> well, okay, so it's a fair question, though. It's just that I don't use PC sealers, so uh, I don't uh, subscribe to that. Uh, that's another story. I don't want to uh, look. I better say a few words because so many of you've jumped in the pool, and on the way down, you're thinking, "My God, there's no water in this pool." So you're off the high dive. I hope you work so you can have maximum impact. Anyway, I don't use something that isn't necessarily reliable. Do we know for sure? Is the literature in? Is it completely defined that this is the new future and the way to go? But what I had Joe said on the uh, uh, Camillary, Dr. Camillary from the UK, Birmingham, when we had her on the show, uh, she didn't have a problem with it, except she says it's really a problem if you mix it with, she calls it synchronization. But if you're using sodium hypochlorite, 17% EDTA, and you're using BC sealers, that's a problem. And she said you better be thinking about using a buffered saline uh, uh, solution. Uh, you better remove those remnants of sodium hypochlorite and uh, EDTA because they will alter the working physical properties of the BC sealer. So the reason I don't want to go into that now, that's not her question, but I don't want to just be flipping and say I don't use it because it sucks. I want to tell you why I don't use it. I'm using a 50-year-old sealer. It's had hundreds, if not thousands of papers showing it efficacy and it's working. And so I don't just like Buchanan. I mean, Steve just announced a few years ago, after 40 years of using Kerpulp Canal Sealer, I now want that biocompatibility and I'm jumping sealers. Well, that's crazy. Nobody jumps sealers unless you're getting paid. Especially if you had a good experience for four years. And d Oh, did this stand for bullshit or was it for Buford Sealing? Is, does Kerpulp Canal Sealer have a regenerative characteristics? It does, but not in the way the audience thinks. Uh, see, the audience gets caught up with biocompatibility. Well, what about splashes of Kerpulp Canal Sealer, bones completely ro grown in around the root? We, I guess we should make this a little bit visual. So you did a root canal, you know, and you picked up some, uh, some, some very nice anatomy along the way, and you got this big lesion, and you got buttons of sealer, and you're all filled, and you're full. Can we call it regenerative if I see this bone all grow back? 
And do we care what that puff is? Is that a BC puff? Is that a Kerr puff? Is that a, a another kind of sealer puff? Is it a Resolon puff? I mean, if the bone's working, it's a regenerating material. I've always said endodontics is a regenerating material because properly performed, it's the cornerstone of restorative and reconstructive dentistry. Okay, this next question is probably a quick one. Um, what is your opinion about the endovac for cleaning root canals? Never used the endovac. Uh, John Schofel made the endovac. It got a lot of noise. And in fairness to John, up until that time, more or less, we had been doing handheld irrigation. So it was the first way, uh, first thing that came along where uh, you had a canal. And let's just say it was like this. In this zone, you had to prepare your canals to 30, greater than or equal to 30, just to get the cannula, just to get the cannula in there. So the cannula was supposed to go down to within, I think, about one millimeter of length. Well, I never use anything where I have to make the canal fit my method. Like when I go to get shoes, I usually just get shoes that fit my feet versus them carving my foot down so I can get that shoe. Now, I don't know you if like I, that, Joe? I... I just was thinking of something related to this. And remember when we had um, Dr. Gary Glassman do uh, Start to Finish Endo mm -hmm. on our show? Did he use the Endovac? He did. In, okay, because I thought I remembered maybe us talking about that a little bit in the post-presentation um, discussion. Let me say it different. It's not wrong to use the Endovac. But in smaller canals, which a lot of endodontists see because we get the tougher ones, I do not like to have to machine this out. I hate that word, machine. Uh, I like flowing shapes like Phil no, Schilmer talked about. I don't like to have to machine out the apical part of a canal just so I can take a tube and stick it in here. And then it occupies all that space. And I'm going to be pumping water, so I'm going to be vacuuming. So your assistant's irrigating over here with a syringe. It will overflow the tooth. But wait a minute. The suction, the suction, the vacuum uh, goes through the canyon, and it's pulling in this direction. So before this can run off, it's a loop. So you're, you're creating, uh, for effect, you're creating a irrigation that goes down the tube. But before it can go out, it's being pulled back up. So you're having reflux back up uh, inside the tube. So it was a good idea because it was the first maybe effort to be more active, active irrigation. Then we came along with the endovac or the endo activator, and it can go in any shape, yellow, red, blue. Uh, it can, it's easy to use. It's handheld. There's no cords. There's no junk and lines and stuff. So simple, simple, simple. Okay. The next question, Elon said, um, you don't have to answer it if you're nervous about legal stuff, but so I'm going to, I'm going to give you that same option that he gave you. He told the audience that it took him about five minutes to talk about Ronald's courage and boldness to speak the truth when most won't. And then he said what you just said. You don't have to answer this, though. <laughs> okay. Is it possible to use Gentle Wave if bleeding is still present? Well, see, when you get a question like that, and we're up here and they're out there, and that was December of last year, I don't know what that means, but I'll try to play with it. So you have a root, and you have some kind of a canal that makes a turn, and... uh Let's just say for some reason there's granulation tissue inside this periapical lesion and it gets stirred up and all of a sudden blood's pouring back up into the canal. So first thing I want to know when you say is there bleeding, it bleeds, is it inside or out? Is the bleeding coming from periapical? Maybe even through a significant lateral canal? Is the bleeding coming from tissue that you haven't got out yet? Is it because there's tissue down in here that you haven't got out yet? Or is it coming periapical? So if it's, if it's coming from outside, you've probably caused a problem because you're using Genowave. 
you probably yeah, but maybe maybe they they mean there's bleeding. So then can, can I use Gentle Wave versus I'm using Gentle Wave? The bleeding starts, but should I still keep going? <laughs> I don't well, know. Absolutely. I don't know what the hell they mean. The order. Right. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, you have to think as a teacher uh, extemporaneously because the question comes and you've got to try to get into that hint immediately. So you got to start thinking. It could be thinking about this. He's thinking about she wants to know. OK, so you got to kind of answer it in convoluted ways, but you're trying to get to the bottom of the question. So, first of all, maybe you could identify inside and out. And then the two, <laughs> you already beat me to it. Were you using gentle wave? When the bleeding started. Because this is one of the things in the early days of gentle wave users, and they've done their hand homework and they've adjusted and modified the old sports terms to make it work. And so bleeding episodes apparently are down, not completely from what I hear, but back in the day, there was bleeding on vast majority of cases. I said the vast majority. Uh, it was on their own website. Uh, Son Hendo had a website called Doc Matters, and it was a place for me and you to do our new technology and report our results for everybody here. You'd learn from me, I'd learn from you. Uh, so if it was not from Gentle Wave, you're probably in good shape. But if you're in Gentle Wave and it's bleeding, you got to control the blood. So get get the platform off the tooth if you're using Gentle Wave. And uh, I would really be careful using uh, ferric sulfates or uh, these vasoconstrictors because you're going to end up with a coagulum so you'll stop the bleeding i've seen people take their paper point put it in ferric sulfate call it in call it in take it to the lead pump it up and down pump 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 and all of a sudden the bleeding starts to diminish but we used it in surgery for decades still do it's one of the great hemostatics that was black coagulum and if you didn't sit there with your curette and scrape that all out and promote new bleeding then that coagulum is is a culture for bacteria probably if you had bleeding that was persisting you would probably want to try to stop the bleeding before you proceeded with anything is that's that... that's what i'm trying to say so you might use some calcium hydroxide okay so you might if you did have bleeding down here you're probably thinking calcium hydroxide calcium hydroxide okay and uh you might have to reappoint. Okay. So that costs a visit, and that's pretty expensive in today's world uh, of disposables and chit-chat and wasting time when you're not doing productive work. So I don't want to go off on this because we don't know exactly, but bleeding, let's just assume it wasn't from anything other than tissue left inside. You got to go back and do more cleaning. If you think it's coming from out here, you've probably, you could have, your files could have been long. What if your file is sticking out here and your, you know, granulation tissue, you just look at it and it starts to bleed. It's the first tissue in disease and it's the first tissue in healing. It's kind of like a chameleon. But as soon as you get the biology right, it helps promote healing. So files can cause bleeding. Residual tissue left behind can cause bleeding. Sometimes we, uh, the canal goes around like this, but the colleague ends up over here. And if you look at this root at the end, you have the world's biggest rip. So that'd be your frame. It used to be right there, but now you've moved it over here and dragged it. And so now you have this canal. It's like this. You've mutilated the root. And of course, those are called blutters. Bleed. They bleed a lot. All right. Well, we have one more question and we're tight on time. So I'm only going to give you the opportunity to say a couple sentences on it. Um, I want to tell our audience that we recently did a podcast where you gave a very thorough opinion on this. So mm. you might want to check out the podcast um, for a very detailed response. But for a short, you're just going to give a short answer now. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the single cone technique? Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, um, I want you to... Well, there's uh, a lot more than you said, right. but that's... You know, why? Okay. So then I invite you to all to go watch the podcast because we say a lot about it. So anyway. If you want to see Hess's anatomy, I didn't say this earlier in the show. If you want show, the look. If you want the look, go look at Hess's. It's a book of 10,000 sections. I have the only one in North America. And as you turn the pages, you're just stunned by how the anatomy looks. And Schiller said, how could you practice a whole career and you never saw any of that, ever? That means you're missing a lot. 
So you're not going to get it with a single cone. You'll get paid. Insurance will pay you. All right. Well, thank you for that Q&A. And now let's close the show with some more cases about the look. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we mentioned at the close of our segment on the look that at the end of the show, you were going to show some cases related to the look. And I think you said you were going to show looks bad is bad, looks bad is good, looks good is bad, and looks good is good. Is that correct? Wow, yes. Okay. <laughs> that always confuses me. Well, I'm going to step aside and let you show them. Okay, so I'm just going to end this whole thing as we're questioning. It's a question. Is it a controversy? The look, is it a controversy? Uh, very quick, you saw these earlier in the show, but if you start holding these up to formal shape form, continuous taper, maintain the original anatomy, maintain the position of the foramina, keep the foramina as small as possible, you can begin to see that's your post-treatment checklist. And that's what I would say for every one of these. You'll also notice, because one of the questions Lisa asked me was, well, do you see anatomy? Well, you see a lot of anatomy in cases that uh, that you've actually prepared well. Now, we've talked about the third, the third, the third, the third. Uh, you can see how that kind of works. I, I would say we're actually smaller if you're going from this wall in. This is probably about a third, and this is about a third, but actually very conservative for me. This is a, a fluted root, so this looks appropriate. And then right here, you might have missed this one. There used to be a lesion here. If I showed you the whole case and all the images, you would have seen a preoperative loss of bone. There was a periodontal defect. And I was thrilled about this. I didn't even put a file in the middle one. That's why it has reverse apical architecture. So even the monkey can fall out of the tree and sometimes the monkey is rolled. And then I saw that. And then we have recalls with the bone growing back in. The bone is depositing. It's a regenerative procedure endodontics must have the look. So let's look at the look real quick. We can go very, very fast and we'll get the first one in here. So this is stuff you see every day in your practice, whether you're an endodontist, lottery treatments, uh, your general dentist, new patients move in, or maybe you have a, a couple here and there. And things that don't look right aren't right. Remember we said that. Uh, this is Phil short. Uh, this is a little short, but it could have been the in a three-dimensional model, it could have been the actual foramen. But what about this distance from here to here? From here to here. They're not even. So what that means is there should be another system in here. So things that don't look right to rattle aren't right, and they, they don't hold up over time, even if you get lucky for a few years. Uh, now, this looks pretty bad to me, but you know what? Ask a question. If you must speak, ask a question. When was your work done? About 35 years ago, doctor. I hope my work lasts 35 years, but look at this is a really stupid little preparation here. It's got a silver, got a silver point in the lingual, in the buckle. Yeah, you're over here. But again, if we look at the rules of symmetry, we're not centered. And when I retreated this, in fact, I got that and I got that. So this one post is a little large. I like these nick down a little bit, take that shoulder off, but kind of incomplete endodontics, spotty endodontics, but the bone, it has intact PDLs, intact PDLs. So it's looking good and it's working. It's not looking good. And then we do this one and we've seen this a million times, haven't we? Where you trained is will tell me a lot about who you are and how you approach your work. But training oftentimes was work short. Now, I understand you have apex locators. Maybe they didn't have them back then. I understand you got CBCT, you got all these different things and tools. But in this case, one millimeter short made a difference. I had to retreat this case. It failed because of philosophy, one millimeter short. So looks good is bad because a lot of you would say it looks good because my school taught me to work one millimeter short. That has a nice dense taper, nice uniform taper. Oh, wow, it's bigger than the, look at this. It's really like a lot of you minimally invasive. You're loving that. Uh, it's not a third, 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 which should be towards the maximum. This is like a quarter, okay? So it's very nice in so many respects, just didn't work. And finally, looks good is good. 
So you can see two systems, pretty broad route out here. I'm pretty close. I'm getting glare off the screen, but I see PDL coming down like that. There we go. So if you start to look at these distances again, to just bring that back home, it has nice flow. Look at apically, there's that little abrupt er, recurvature back to the mesial and good solid bone around the puff. So real quick, just some cases that I would say develop the look. Did you notice something today, everybody, all the audience around here? Did you notice that we're showing only maxillary bicuspids? I would have loved to do this. We started to do this. We were going to show a little random of all the teeth in the mouth. And it got too confusing because there were hundreds of teeth to choose from them. So we said, well, let's just take maxillary bicuspids as an example and show a few looks. So this is carrying a bridge. It's a strategic tooth in the most venereal sense. Uh, two systems, apically, I see one, two, three. I see four apical portals of exit. So I think to me that has the look. And I didn't even mention, but a very, very tough access. Here's the crown coming in like this. You can't tell what's under here, how it was prepared. You don't know. So we started in right in the middle of the crown. And then as I get up here, I have to make an adjustment and come back. So really roller coaster, kind of a complicated little case. Another one, I want to show some strategic teeth today. Teeth are carrying large spans. And they are very, very critical for this patient. So look at this. We have a significant branch here. If you would have seen the pre-op, there was a big black area in here, and you, it didn't probe. So I knew it was a lesion of endodontic origin, so for me, it's fun. And sure enough, that would explain it. This is a recall. Got an apical bifidity in the buckle, and we got that little, you know, like a little recurvature of the lingual, and then it's bifid on top of it. So that right there is that right there. So... Learn to build the Schilderian objectives into your cases. The modern-day files a lot of times will build that in for you. You don't have to think about such a long sequence of instruments. Different kind of a case, three systems. That has the look. That looks good to me. And finally, our last collage of images isn't showing you the whole look on anything except the middle tooth. And again, I'm very excited when I see cases like this. Again, I just keep beating this to death. We keep hearing over and over around the world, God, those big Schilderian shapes. Oh, the shaping party's over. Schilder's obsolete. The people that are telling you that are just people that uh, are woke and they have their own religion and endodontics and they're quoting their own uh, game. So notice if you want to go around more than 90 degrees, get three portals of exit, there's the look, and every one of these cases has significant anatomy. That was one of Lizette's questions was, was it just the shape that he was talking about, or did the look mean everything? And I'm going to say it means everything. So bring it home. Well, thank you for presenting that information. I, I just want to ask you, so when you fill a case and you see something like this here, yeah, I'll circle it. Yeah. How does it make you feel? Oh, my. How does it make you <laughs> I loved endodontics. It was like a drug. It brought me back. I mean, I get we, anybody that gets lateral canals, even after 30, 40, 50 years, you can't get too many lateral canals. You can't get tired of winning. Okay. Well, thank you. And that was a fun show. We'll see you next time on The Rebel Show. 